Hello and welcome back. Uh, in this video, I wanted to talk about having difficult conversations about difficult topics. And I'm specifically directing this towards ministers and ministry. Um, in the world that we live in, there is no shortage of difficult topics and difficult conversations. And there is no uh, shortage even of perspectives. There is no shortage of uh, directions that people coming from. And all the time, even myself and you probably have as well, are, are hearing opinions that you've never heard before. Even if you've been in ministry a long time, I'm still hearing elders and other uh, ministers tell me about perspectives and different things that they're hearing and developments that maybe they've never heard before. And so there's no shortage of difficult topics to have. Um, and in this video, I'm going to talk about how we can have some of those difficult conversations, how we can have them in a biblical manner, how we can have them in a respectful manner, uh, and how we can have them in a, in a way that's going to best allow us to provide ministry to people in a way that's going to uh, be, be respectful, that's going to be a way that's encouraging, that's going to be a way that will leave the door open for future interaction and dialogue. And um, and we're just going to talk about lots of different things in this uh, uh, video today. <clears throat> but one of the things that I would just want to open up to clarify some terms, what types of difficult topics are we talking about? Now, this is an introduction. This is not all-encompassing. Obviously, there are far, far more uh, difficult conversations that I could reference and that I could mention. Uh, but here are some of the ones that I, I want to hit. These are some of the common ones, especially in the world that we're living today. Uh, religion and spirituality, obviously, uh, being in, in, in dialogue with different um, religious denominations and finding out and understanding what people, other people mean uh, when they say and what, what they actually believe. In my work as a chaplain, I have uh, both in a hospital and in a hospice setting, uh, and also in my... Uh, for forays into academia. I have had many different uh, interactions with people of different faith and people of different uh, denominations, and I've had many different conversations exploring what they believed, exploring uh, what I have believed, and I have found through these conversations in my personal experience that my faith has not been weakened by those conversations, but in fact I am more firmly rooted in what I believe through having respectful uh, dialogue and respectful conversations uh, with other people and individuals. This also helps when people come into our churches from different backgrounds and from different understandings uh, of God and different understandings of salvation how we can have conversations with them so that we can truly understand where they're coming from and, and not assume where they're coming from. Uh, race, obviously, this is a topic that not many people like talking about. Um, but again, especially in my work in chaplaincy, I've talked to people of, of a variety of different ethnic backgrounds and, and, and race backgrounds, uh, many different people of color, and, uh, and, ha and hearing their wide and varied opinions on the status of race, especially here in North America. America, and being able to have those conversations in a respectful manner where we can both learn and dialogue from each other um, is very important. Um, even when it comes to talking about sex, this is a topic that uh, many people feel uncomfortable talking about, especially in church contexts, right? Um, we don't often like talking about sex. It's often been a taboo subject, even though there's no shortage of scriptures in the Bible that talk about sex, um, especially in the world that we live in, though, because uh, the, the understanding of sex has become so convoluted. And so uh, there's so many different opinions and perspectives when it comes to things like gender and gender roles, uh, sexuality, sexual orientation. There's so many different perspectives that people might have. Um, and if we're going to respond to these uh, in a biblical manner, we need to know how to dialogue about them in a biblical manner. Uh, and even when it comes to politics, uh, obviously we live in a very politically divisive time, and there's no shortage of people uh, claiming Christianity on both sides of the political aisle, right and left, Republican and Democrat. Democrat, and no matter which side of the aisle you sit on, I'm this in this uh, section. I'm going to kind of 
be talking about how we can have some of those difficult conversations. And of course, even sin. Sin is a, is an ambiguous term even nowadays. What is sin? Does sin exist? Um, um, who is sinful and who is not? Um, but being able to talk about those things. Now, again, I, I'm, I'm giving you some introductions. Obviously, you've are probably very quickly able to think about other areas and other topics that are very difficult to address and very difficult to talk about. Um, I, I have seen so many different cases where uh, uh, situations have arisen in churches uh, with these topics and also other topics that pastors have said, I never thought I would deal with this in, in 20, 30 years of pastoring. And they've shared that with me and they said, this is a new one for me. Um, because it's something that they didn't have to deal with or they didn't address. Um, maybe they should have dealt with it, but they didn't deal with it in yesteryear. Uh, and so now it's coming up. And so in this, I'm going to talk about how we can have some of those difficult conversations. Um, in this, you won't find me talking, uh, coming down and giving a lot of uh, perspectives on, on, on what you should be saying and what answers you should be having. Um, because obviously, if I was going to address each one of these areas and talk about, okay, this is what your answer is to this situation. This is what your answer is to that situation. Uh, then obviously, this video would be very, 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 very long. And so instead, what this video is specifically going to be addressing is how to have the conversation. Maybe not necessarily what your content and your side of the conversation is, um, but we're specifically going to be talking about how to have the conversation, right? Before we address that, um, let's answer the question of why. As Christian ministers, why should we be having difficult conversations? Why should we be talking about race, sex? Why should we be talking about uh, sin? Why should we be talking to people about different religions and denominations and what different people uh, believe? <clears throat> and uh, here's a few short answers why. First of all, these things are affecting people's spiritual, mental, emotional, and psychological well-being. And we as Christian ministers are called to care for every single one of these areas. We are called to minister to people's spiritual state, to their mental state, to their emotional state. Um, and if we truly believe that the Word of God is able to comfort and to bring peace of mind and, and to, to strengthen us and to bring a unity, then there's no reason why we shouldn't be addressing and talking about these areas that so strongly impact people's mind and people's well-being. Here's another reason is because people are already talking about them. People are already getting input and ma the majority of input that people are having on topics of politics, of topics of sin, um, of topics of denominationalism, uh, most of these topics that they're uh, receiving input on are from ungodly sources. If Christian ministers avoid these conversations, then people may assume, it's an incorrect assumption, but they still might assume that God or the Bible or church or ministry, etc., either does not care or does not have an answer. Oftentimes, when uh, ministers remain silent about hot-button issues, um, it, it, it might come across as though we just don't want to talk about it. It might come across as, well, we're trying to be people pleasers by avoiding the conversation altogether. Uh, we do no benefit for our congregations when we avoid the topics that they are talking about at the restaurant after service. We do them no favors when we do not dialogue with them and find out what they are talking about uh, when they are going and talking to their coworkers about it. When our young people are going and having the conversations with their schoolmates and their classmates about it, we do no favors to them when we avoid what they are talking about. By addressing these difficult topics, we have a chance to positively influence this conversation. If we believe that Jesus is the answer for the world today, if we believe that the Bible holds the answers to truth, if we believe that, that God <coughs> is the answer <coughs> excuse me, to these different situations, uh, then why should we be afraid to enter in and dialogue with people about these conversations? And here's another reason why I firmly believe that we should be having a conversation. And that is specifically chosen 
above a lecture, above a sermon even. This is why we should be having conversations about these topics, right? By providing a dialogue rather than just a one-directional lecture, we can let people know that we truly care about what they're thinking and what they're feeling and where they're coming from. If we can better understand their experiences, then we can better minister to their needs. It is impossible to effectively minister to someone when we assume all of their needs, when we assume their positions, when we assume their backgrounds. It is impossible for me, in my context, in my culture, in my background, and in my upbringing, to understand where every person is coming from. And I cannot effectively minister to them without understanding that I come from a very specific context that not everybody else comes from, right? Uh, and just to give you uh, an, a, a few brief examples, right? As a male, I don't completely understand what females go through in terms of uh, 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 difficulties with, with calling, difficulties with knowing their roles in a relationship, difficulty with knowing their roles in church, uh, difficulty with uh, knowing how the Bible addresses them and, 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 and certain difficult passages that refer to women in the Bible. If I don't know what their experiences are in regards to these things and how it's hitting their ears, I'm not able to effectively minister to them, right? I am a young person. At the time of recording this, I'm 27 years old, uh, even though I've been in ministry for uh, the better part of a decade, and I'm ordained with the United Pentecostal Church International, and, um, and I apologize for my, for my screensaver coming on here, um, but I'm a young person. I do not completely understand the experiences of those who are in older generations than I am. And even beyond that, I don't completely understand the experiences of Gen Zers uh, and other people who are in younger generations. I can speak somewhat for my age range, but I cannot properly address and speak to all age ranges. Um, the same is true for my skin tone. Right, being raised as a white person in a predominantly white context, I cannot assume uh, and I cannot completely understand the experiences of African Americans, of immigrants, of other people who who have not had the same uh, upbringings that I have and have not had the same opportunities that I've had, who have been raised in, in entirely different communities. And so I cannot assume that I can effectively minister to people of color or to immigrants or to any other uh, people outside of my, I need to be in dialogue so I can understand their experiences better. And that way I can better stir, minister to them and, and better understand uh, what they are going through. And I could go on and give all kinds of different conversations, uh, all, all kinds of different examples. Um, but through all of these, um, even if we end up disagreeing at the end of the conversation, let us let it not be said that we did not engage the conversation from a Christian, biblical perspective. Even if at the end of the conversation we still disagree, let us always make sure that I am not being uh, uh, con uh, uh, um, um, I'm not being uh, um, uh, I'm trying to find the, the, the word that I'm looking for. Uh, I'm not being brash. I'm not being offensive. I'm not being um, overly um, o o overly uh, you know, harsh in my responses. I, I, I am not uh, being, um, you know, unduly confrontational. Um, and I'm not being biased. I'm not being unlistening. I'm not being uh, uh, controversial. Well, I'm not being all the different things. I'm trying to avoid the pitfalls. And, and I'm trying to have a conversation in a respectful manner. Now, that being said, the, peer, the person you're dialoguing with might not always be respectful, might not always be, uh, you know, have the same perspective, right? They, they might choose controversy. They might choose offensiveness. They might choose name calling um, in any of these categories that I've talked to. But let it never be said of you as a Christian minister that you responded in like kind. We do not dialogue as the world dialogues. We do not dialogue as people without Christ and the Holy Spirit living inside of us, right? We do not dialogue with people um, as, as those without Christ 
based dialogue. So for us who are Christians, and especially for those of us who are ministers, let us always dialogue in a biblical, Christ-like manner. And so here are some guiding uh, biblical principles that we can follow. A word fitly spoken, and these are all simply in order that they appear in the Bible. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. In other words, a a, a well-timed word, a a wisely spoken word, a word in just the right place is a thing of of pricelessness, is a thing of beauty, and can greatly affect, positively affect a conversation. How about this? The very commonly referred to golden rule in Matthew 7.12. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. If you expect people to respect your position and people to hear out what you have to say in terms of your belief about God, your belief about your church, your belief about salvation, if you are expecting people to, to, to honor and hear out what you have to say, then you obviously need to be willing to to sit down and hear out with what they have to say um, and try to understand and, and have empathy for their position, even if at the end of the day you don't agree with their position. How about this? In Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 through 37, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Oftentimes when we enter into conversations about politics, when we enter into conversations about race, uh, our words can very quickly become careless. They can very quickly become brash. They can very quickly become offensive. Um, But on Judgment Day, Jesus said that we would give an account for every careless word that we said, every flippant word that we tossed out there, every insult, um, every generalization and every stereotype, um, every, every everything that we said behind someone's back instead of being in dialogue with them, uh, we will give an account for all of those words. Uh, and we need to take that seriously. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. How about this? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may, may give grace to those who hear. A dialogue and conversation that tears down, that generalizes, that stereotypes, that insults, um, that is unfair, uh, that is not respectful, that is, that is not honorable, that is corrupting talk. Um, and Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said, don't let those types of words come out of your mouth. Uh, make sure the words that you are, are saying are good for building up are good for edifying, um, that are fitting to the occasion, right? Um, If you're talking about one topic of conversation, uh, don't distract by bringing up another topic of conversation, right? What is fitting? What is the current, uh, uh, you know, concept. Don't don't try to tear down someone's reputation by by bringing up something else when you're dialogue about about something specific, right? Make sure that you are 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 speaking in kind and speaking correctly for for what we're talking about at the current moment. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Each person, not just people who are in the church, not just people you agree with, but all people. Your speech needs to be gracious, not insulting, not tearing down, uh, not offensive. Uh, Your speech needs to be gracious, seasoned with salt, right? If the salt has lost its savor, wherewith will it be salted, right? Uh, If we are going to be the salt of the earth, that includes in our speech and in our dialogue and how we interact with people. Uh, Moreover, a minister must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. This is part of the very well-known qualifications for ministers in 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, that many religious organizations actually hold up as a standard for what they expect their uh, credentialed ministers to hold to. Um, And one of the often understated and often not talked about qualifications is that a minister uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the original language, a, a bishop or an overseer, um, all, all loaded languages, but I'll, I'll say minister uh, to kind of be all-encompassing. A minister must be thought well of by outsiders. That includes people that do not agree with his theology. That includes people who don't agree with, 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 with the minister's perspective or, or the other things that she believes, right? Right. Um, 
uh, if a minister is going to be uh, uh, truly qualified, as Paul wrote to Timothy, they must have a good reputation from those who are outside. And if people outside the church uh, view you as contentious, uh, view you as harsh, view you as insulting, view you as unwilling to uh, sit down and do the necessary work that is needed um, to have a conversation, to understand people, uh, if people don't have a good opinion of you from the outside, um, that's not something to be proud of. Now, obviously, there will be instances where persecution will come. Obviously, there will be disagreements. But again, even if there is disagreement, let it never be said that you were insulting, that you were contentious, that you were proudful, uh, that, that any of those other negative conversation qualities were present in your conversation. Um, and I have often found that if a minister is able to do this, uh, they're not compromising in their doctrine. They're not compromising in what they believe just because they are able to have respectful conversations. And I am, it's a state of, of, of you know, it's something that I am very grateful for, that I have uh, friends who know what I believe and know that I disagree with them in certain areas. Uh, and yet there is such a level of respect between me and them because uh, even though I will, I will still witness to them and even though I will still share what I believe, they know that I am, I am going to do it in a respectful manner and I'm going to dialogue with them and hear what they have to say as well, even if they are outside of the church and outside of the denomination. How about this? But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. The wisdom from above, in other words, the wisdom that we receive from God, the knowledge that we have from Him, uh, is not one that is unpeaceable, is not one that is contentious, is not one that is unreasonable, uh, is not one that is unmerciful right? If we are going to be full of godly wisdom, then we are going to be peaceable. We are not going to have unpeaceful, contentious conversations. We are going to be gentle with one another. We're not going to be insulting or brash or rough with others. Um, we're not going to be unreasonable, right? We are going to be open to reason and, and, and to dialogue, right? Um, the, the faith that we have is not unreasonable. I, I know oftentimes people will say that, that we don't have a reasonable faith, but, but, but we do have a reasonable faith. Um, um, I, I, we, we are not completely void of reason. Um, and, uh, and James makes that very clear. There's clear Bible for that, that if you're going to have wisdom from God, then you will be a reasonable person, uh, and you will be full of mercy, you will be full of good fruits, you will be impartial, and you will be sincere. Now, those are difficult pills to swallow, um, but if we're going to be full of godly wisdom, <clears throat> then we are going to hear people out and what they have to say in sincerity. Not just hearing people uh, in order so that we may respond to them, that, but that we may hear them in sincerity. Uh, that we may listen to people with impartiality and then make a decision based on what is biblical and not based on personal biases or earthly biases or backgrounds, okay? Um, but we are going to hear things impartially and then respond biblically and respond godly. Um, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. One of the reasons I love this verse is because it starts off with honor everyone and then goes to love the brotherhood. Um, and so it's very clear that you are supposed to be able to give honor to everyone, not just those who you consider, quote unquote, your brothers, not just those who are in the same uh, 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 denomination as you, not just those who are um, hold the same licensure as you, not just those who are also pastors, not just those who are, you know, hold the same like-minded faith, but you are to honor everyone, even if you disagree with them. Um, and, uh, and part of this is connected to fearing God. Part of this is connected to honoring God. If we will fear God and honor God, then, then, then we will honor everyone. Uh, who are who is also made in the image of God. Everyone you meet, regardless of how strongly you might disagree with them, is made in God's image. And being respectful and honoring them as someone who is made in God's image is part of our commission uh, and part of our responsibility as ministers. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. 
don't repay evil for evil. If someone dialogues with you in a harsh way, even if they don't, even if that other party does not respond in the way that I am admonishing you to respond uh, and, and, and admonishing you to dialogue in this video, even if they don't follow uh, these rules of engagement, uh, I don't repay evil for evil. If they insult you, do not insult them back. Uh, on the contrary, bless. One of the more difficult uh, things that we that we hear from Jesus is to bless those who curse you. Um, and there is no shortage of people who are willing to curse the church. There is no shortage of people who are willing to blaspheme Christianity. Uh, but Jesus says that we need to pray for them. And we do not need to respond with evil uh, just because evil has been thrown at us. But we need to be a blessing church. We need to be a prayerful church. We need to be an honoring church. And then finally, the last verse I'll mention, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. We often hear it quoted that we need to be ready to make a defense for anyone who asks of you. But Peter was very quick to qualify, do it in gentleness and respect. You can believe what you believe as a Christian and do it with respect and with gentleness. You can tell someone you disagree with them and do it with gentleness and respect. You, you, can, you can stand firm on the doctrine that you believe, but you can do it in gentleness and respect. You don't have to be harsh. You do not, even if other people are being harsh, you don't have to be. You can be full of gentleness and respect. And I will just say this in the conclusion to this slide, that there are far more verses uh, that I could have included on this slide that comes about, uh, talks about having respectable conversation, that talks about honoring one another, that talks about uh, 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 making sure your words are always with grace and seasoned with salt. There's so many different uh, uh, passages that touch on this. <clears throat> but these are the ones that I wanted to highlight. Um, and one thing I discovered in my preparation for this is that first Peter especially provides fantastic uh, guidelines for having this type of gentle respectful honoring conversation if you read the book of first Peter uh, with this light you will find a great insight on how to have these types of difficult conversations <clears throat> so now that we've talked we've kind of laid some ground rules uh, for what we're talking about why we're talking about it and some biblical principles to guide our conduct uh, I want to provide two quick pages of what I'm calling rules of engagement um, the first one is a uh, is a to-do list uh, and the second one is a don't do list so this is uh, something that I'm going to admonish that these are guidelines that I follow when I have these types of conversations and you would always do well to have these types of conversations uh, with your church with people in your church with with anyone uh, who, who has this type of difficult conversation and you're wanting to respond to it <clears throat> um, these are always good things to practice when it comes to dialogue first of all create a safe space for dialogue right and um, uh, people will not feel safe if they're in an environment where you are ganging up on them, when they do not feel safe to completely and honestly express what they believe. Um, and if they feel as if they're being ganged up on, if they feel like they're in a vulnerable space. Uh, for example, if you're having a difficult conversation with someone of another sexual orientation uh, or another uh, gender identity, um, they might not want to have that conversation um, out in a public setting where they might be shamed. They might also not want to have it with 10 other people who do not agree with them. Um, but if there's a safe space with two or three people um, or, 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 you know, in some other type of quiet public setting, um, you know, create that safe space where people can feel open and honest. Again, even if you disagree with them. Um, this is another reason why uh, Facebook is often not a good place for dialogue and not a safe space for dialogue because it's very hard to read intentions. It's very hard to read um, background, especially when you are posting things in a public light that all of the world can see. Um, and uh, people might not feel comfortable. And, and, and honestly, those types of online conversations are, are very rarely productive. Uh, and very rarely Christian and Christ-like, too, I, I might add. Um, and, and 
So make sure there's sufficient space. And that, that includes the space, but that also includes the time. Um, don't schedule 10 minutes for something that probably needs an hour to address, especially if you are on vastly different sides of the conversation. Uh, make sure you provide enough time. There's nothing more uh, frustrating when, when uh, there's a heavy topic like, like race um, and, and you're having a conversation with someone uh, of another skin tone and you're trying to understand uh, their background and their perspective and you've only allotted 10 minutes for this conversation. Uh, 10 minutes is, is, is almost never enough time to have a difficult conversation. Um, and so make sure you have enough time. Assume good intentions. Uh, oftentimes, if we come in assuming that the other person is out to get us, and again, sometimes they are, but always start from a position of assuming good intentions. Don't assume that they're out to get you. Uh, otherwise, you will instinctively either start on the attack or start on the defense. But assume that there's good intentions. Assume that the other person is not, uh, especially if it's something that is not uh, in terms of salvation or not in terms of sin. If we're talking about something culturally, if we're talking about politics, if we're talking about um, race issues, if we're talking about other things like that, assume good intentions. Don't assume that the other people, person that you're dialoguing with, the other party you're dialoguing with, is only out to harm you and only out to hurt you. You're not doing yourself or the other person any favors by assuming they have negative intentions. If they do have bad intentions, uh, that will become apparent throughout the dialogue. But do not start the conversation from a position of assuming that they are, uh, ha they ha they, you know, they're coming from a negative place. Keep your position rooted in the Bible. Say what the Bible says and refuse to say what it doesn't. Again, this is a guide for Christian ministers. Uh, we do well by, by making sure that uh, our position is not rooted in emotionalism, that our position is not rooted in some sort of nationalism or some other sort of uh, uh, non-biblical position. Um, a quote that I love is to say what the Bible says and refuse to say what it doesn't. What does the Bible say about the topics of political involvement? What does the Bible say about race issues? What does the Bible say about gender and sexual identity? What does the Bible say uh, about uh, different denominations? Um, and, and you might say, well, the Bible says this, but it doesn't say this in this area. You are always safe if you're in the Bible. Say what the Bible says and refuse to say what it doesn't. And that's whether or not you agree with it or whether you disagree with it. Refuse to say what the Bible doesn't. And I do apologize for my screen shaver, saver uh, coming on so frequently. Always engage with empathy. Try to understand and see things from their perspective uh, and their point of view, um, even if you don't agree. Uh, and this is something that we would all do well to uh all do well to follow. Uh, if we do not approach something from sincerely trying to see the other person's position, then we are not going to be able to effectively dialogue with them. Um, we might, you might come in with a certain stereotype or a certain idea or assumption about what the other person believes, um, but I cannot tell you how many times that I have been wrong in my assumptions um, about another person, about their belief system, about their perspective, about their opinion. Uh, and so instead of me trying to assume what they're trying to say, then trying sincerely to understand what they are trying to say, sincerely understanding their position and not just a, a blanket assuming what they believe. Not only that, speak for yourself. It is not your responsibility, nor is it your right to speak for, quote unquote, all of us. It's not your responsibility to speak for all of us white people for all of us Republicans, all of us Democrats, um, all of us uh, homosexuals, all of us uh, Christians, all of us straight people, all of us Americans, all of us immigrants. It's not your responsibility to speak for all of us. It's not your right to speak for all of us. I, Even though I might be a white Christian, I cannot speak for all white people, nor can I speak for all Christians. That is not my responsibility, and it is not my right. And so uh, when I'm having a dialogue and when I'm having a conversation, uh, speak for yourself. 
um, if you if you generally speak to um, some some statements of an organization or some statements of a group to which you belong, uh, then clarify what is what you are speaking of in terms of this is the stated organization beliefs of the organization and clarify what you are stating this is how I personally approach it um, and again if you are staying in the Bible this this will be a very uh, easy position to do um, but avoid speaking for all of us um, and uh, that's often not helpful in a dialogue or in a conversation be respectful Avoid name-calling, avoid extremities, avoid generalizations, avoid stereotypes. Um, in, in general, uh, again, in the same way that you shouldn't say um, you shouldn't speak for all of us people, um, it's really not helpful to speak to all of you people. Um, whether, you know, you cannot speak to the issues and say all of you Republicans, all of you Democrats, all of you black people, all of you white people, all of you, any other category you want to put in there. Um, um, it, it, speak to the issue at hand because the person you are dialoguing with is going to have a perspective and a position that is going to be unique within his or her own context. Um, even though I am a Christian and I belong to an organization, my position is nuanced. Um, even though I might hold to some general tenets of the entire organization, um, I am not going to speak for the entirety of my own uh, organization or even the entirety of my own race, the entirety of my own gender. I cannot speak to those things. Um, and so um, um, you cannot assume that about me, and, and nor can I assume that about you. Um, so avoid those things. And of course, that goes. it goes without saying to avoid name-calling to avoid insulting labels, especially if you know things are insulting. I've been having conversations and dialogue, um, and I've said something that I didn't know was offensive. Um, and I used a term, and I'm specifically thinking of one example where I used a term with a, a person of color. And I used this term, and, and thankfully, uh, he was kind enough to correct me and said, you know, some people um, consider that to be a, a pretty offensive term towards towards uh, people of, of mixed heritage, um, and that was a learning um, uh, uh, a learning curve for me. Um, but I, I wasn't about to say stand up and say, well, no, that's not a disrespectful term, um, because he said, look, I, I I'm offended by that term, and I know other people. Who are, have been offended by that term. Um, I'm not going to be deliberately using terms that I know are offensive. Again, if my if my perspective and my approach is trying to be respectful, um, then then I'm going to not deliberately be contentious. I'm not deliberately going to be uh, obnoxious and throwing around labels that I know are inflammatory. Um, because that really shows my motivation. It shows your motivation when you um, are not uh, when you, when you deliberately use that types of inflammatory language. <clears throat> How about this? Um, ask questions to clarify anything you do not uh, fully understand. And I would actually uh, connect that to this last one as well. And I'm going to move this up here so that I can talk about both of them together. Ask questions to clarify anything you do not fully understand. And if necessary, establish a definition of terms. You both might be saying the same thing and mean something completely different, right? Um, I'll use I'll use the subject of abortion. Abortion is a very wide, varied subject, um, and and when one person addresses abortion uh, from from one perspective and another person addresses it from another perspective, uh, they might have very different opinions on what they mean when they are dialoguing about abortion, um, and and it might be a difference of dialoguing of, of term length of length of term right how long someone's into it. Um, the the status or the motivation behind the motive behind the abortion, um, but if you don't understand where that particular individual is coming from, um, for some people it might be a health risk, for some other people it might be an issue of convenience, for some people uh, there might be some other factor that 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 might not be involved, um, and so understand and get a definition of terms. When I'm dialoguing with somebody about race, 
right? I want to clarify what they mean by race and what I mean by race. Um, if someone uses a term, I'll give a very loaded term, uh, uh, of white privilege. That's a term that we've been hearing a lot about right now. Um, I'm saying white privilege, and some people watching this might have easily and very quickly bristled to the term. But what I have found when I have dialogued with different people from different backgrounds about uh, their perspective, uh, uh, when one person says white privilege, it means something very different to another person. Um, and, and, and it hits the ear very differently. And so if necessary, ask clarifying questions. What do you mean by that? When you use this term, what are you referring to? Ask questions because if, if you heard the term white privilege and you immediately uh, felt a rise up and you immediately felt to respond, um, um, you might be responding to something that I don't mean. And a quick, uh, um, a, a quick response or a quick angry response or even just a, even if it's not angry, even if it's just assuming something. Um, of what they're meaning uh, can often derail the conversation. So ask clarifying questions. Uh, and say, what do you mean by that? Uh, 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 and establish a definition of terms if needed. And this can really much help you uh, when it comes to having a, having a dialogue. And I will finally say this. Be willing to be wrong. Or at the very least, understand that you might need a change you might need to change your mind or broaden your perspective. Um, and when I say be willing to be wrong, again, I'm talking about non-doctrinal, non-salvific areas, right? Um, sometimes when it comes to our understandings of race, when it comes to our understanding of politics, uh, if we've been raised in a very closed society, if we've been raised in a very uh, 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 an echo chamber, if you will, where we're only hearing one opinion or we're only hearing one background, um, then uh, we actually might end up doing ourselves a disfavor um, by saying that my perspective is, is only ever right. Uh, but be willing to have your perspective stretched. Understand that you are not infallible. Understand that you are not the end all, all source of wisdom. Understand that you are not perfect. If you can understand that, that, that you're not perfect and you don't have all the answers, being imperfect and not having all the answers means that you, are, you don't have all the answers. You don't have every single source of knowledge, right? You don't have the end all say on things. If you did, that would make you God, and that would turn into self-idolatry and blasphemy. Um, so in any conversation, be willing to be wrong. Or at the very least, understand that you might need to change your mind or broaden your perspective. At the very least, our perspectives, all of our perspectives could stand to be broadened. And uh, this is what I'll say for the... Uh, so. so that's some of the to-do lists, right? I also want to provide a do-not-do list. Um, and these are common pitfalls that we do that uh, we would all do well to avoid. First of all, don't talk about someone without talking to them. Don't try to minister to someone without being in conversation with them. Uh, one of the biggest things that, that I have found, especially as uh, over the course of the last year, I'm recording this in the summer of, well, actually in the fall of 2020, and I'm thinking about, about different conversations about race that we've had over the course of the past year. Um, and one of the things that I have been um, convicted about is talking about the, 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 the African American uh, African American people without actually being in dialogue with African Americans. Uh, having Talking about people of color without actually asking people of color what their perspectives are. Um, I, what I have found is that as I have talked to different people and gotten their different perspectives, um, I will find a wide variety of opinions from people of color. Uh, and, and they might not all agree with each other. 
And so by by having a conversation, these types of conversations, and being open and honest with them, uh, what I'm gaining is a wider perspective uh, on different people's opinions about what is going on. And so now I can have a more biblical response. I can have a more well-informed response. Um, but how can I effectively uh, talk about people of color without actually talking to people of color? Um, and when it comes in terms of ministry, how can you effectively minister to the, the, the African Americans and to other people of color in your, con in your congregation? How can you effectively minister to them without being in conversation with them, without understanding what's going on, without understanding their background um, uh, uh, and their experience of the current climate and the current condition. How can you effectively minister to someone without being in conversation with them? Um, and you can apply this to any category. If you're going to be ministering to youth, right, talk to young people about what they're, what they're interested in and what they're talking about in their schools. What are their needs right now? The needs of young people in high school in 2020 are very different than the needs of people in high school in the 90s or in the 80s or in the 70s. Um, uh, it's a very different climate. And how can one who went to high school in the 90s effectively minister to someone who is currently in high school when it's a very different environment? Uh, the same thing uh, with if you're ministering to, to older retirees, right? How, uh, me as a young person, I cannot effectively uh, minister to the needs of older individuals without being in conversation with them. Uh, what are their needs? What are their interests? What are their focuses? What are the things they are concerned about? Um, Essentially, don't talk about people behind their back. If you want a, a, a very short version of this, um, something we all hear and we would do better to practice, don't talk about people behind their back. Don't go and, 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 and be, be all wondering how I can better minister to without actually being in dialogue with. Um, how can I effectively minister to women? As a, as a woman, I, I mean, as a man, I can't answer that because I am not a woman. Um, and so there needs to be dialogue. There needs to be conversation. Um, don't talk about a group without talking to a group. Don't talk about the Democrats without talking to Democrats. Don't talk about the Republicans without talking to Republicans. Don't talk about anyone who's outside of a different perspective. Don't talk about the homosexuals without being in dialogue with people of, of, of that um, sexual orientation. Right, um, or someone who is experience talk about someone who's experiencing gender dysphoria without actually talking to them and finding out what that experience is like. Uh, and, and again, all with all these situations, I'm not pretending like at the end of the day you're going to be agreeing with every single person you have a dialogue with, but you need to at the very at the very least you owe them a respectful conversation because they are another human being uh, and and if you are able to dialogue in this way and I'll just pause right here and say this when you dialogue with people in this manner they're more likely to dialogue with you in this manner however if you are always being contentious and 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 mean and insulting and confrontational then don't be surprised if in response People are mean and, and insulting and confrontational to you. Uh, but as, as, as Jesus said, with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured unto you again. In other words, with the same way, the same measuring stick that you give towards other people, that's what's going to be measured back to you. If you treat people with respect and dialogue, that's going to come back to you. And then you are going to be more effective in your witnessing, more effective in your ministry, more effective in the sharing of what you believe. All right? <clears throat> How about this one? Don't assume that just because they don't want to talk about it. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me ref let me back up. Don't assume that they don't want to talk about it, or that it doesn't need to be talked about just because one or both parties is or in, is uncomfortable uh, talking about it. All right. Uh, uh, don't assume that it doesn't need to be talked about, and don't assume that they don't want to talk about it. Um, many people want to be in dialogue about these things, but if they don't feel safe, obviously, if it's never been addressed, right, um, then then obviously, um, you know, just because it's never been talked about or it's uncomfortable being, being talked about doesn't mean it doesn't need to be talked about. Um, let me use another uncomfortable 
Tom conversation since we've talked about a lot of things that are uncomfortable so far. Uh, many young people, teenagers especially, are having difficult questions in their minds about sex, sexuality. They're asking questions in their mind about masturbation. They're talking, they're, they're in, their, in their mind, they're having all of these different conversations. Um, and sometimes having those conversations can be very uncomfortable. And oftentimes, uh, 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 these young people might be uncomfortable talking about it, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be talked about. Because oftentimes, they will be having conversations with their peers about these uh, about issues of sex uh, um, and sexual orientation about masturbation about all these different other things that 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 are that are uh, can make people who are older feel uncomfortable um, don't assume that they don't want to talk about it don't assume that it doesn't need to be talked about uh, when you are able to talk about these things in a respectable professional biblical manner uh, you are taking away the taboo. You are taking away the forbiddenness of the conversation, and you are able to control the dialogue. You are able to control and make sure it's respectful, making sure it's not crude, making sure it's not offensive, and making sure uh, that, that it's pleasing to God, the conversation that you're having. Um, just because it's uncomfortable to talk about doesn't mean you shouldn't be talking about it. Um, how about this? Don't just talk with people that you know you already agree with. Um, it doesn't do any benefit uh, to yourself to remain in an echo chamber. Um, if you're going to be effectively ministering to people of, of a different background or of a, of a different denomination, um, it doesn't do you any benefit to only talk to people within your own denomination. Um, if you're interested in how to effectively minister to someone of a different religious background, don't only talk to people that you already agree with in your own religious background. For example, if I am interested in how to dialogue with people of, of, of a Hindu faith, of a Buddhist faith, um, of a Muslim faith, I'm not doing myself any benefit to only sit down and dialogue with Christians about what they believe. If I want to effectively understand what, what Muslims believe, I need to sit down and dialogue with a Muslim and have a respectable biblical conversation. Again, we're not sitting down with an attempt to be converted by them. We're not sitting down with an attempt to allow them to uh, uh, change our minds. But we do need to be able to <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we do need to be able to have a respectable conversation and be able to dialogue. Um, if you only talk to people that you already agree with, then your perspective will not be broadened, and you risk remaining in an echo chamber where you do not fully understand, and ultimately you will be an ineffective minister and an ineffective witness um, to those individuals. How about this? Don't assume the people you're talking to agree with you or disagree with you. Don't assume their intentions. Um, I, I know that oftentimes I have been, uh, and I'll give an easy example. Um, I, I have often been in, in hospital rooms with other white people. Um, and, and the white person in the bed will say something very racially offensive towards their a black nurse who is in there ministering to them and caring for them. As a white chaplain, I'll walk in and the white person in bed will give an epitaph uh, or say, using a racist offensive term towards their black nurse. Um, and and uh, what what is happening is they are assuming that just because I'm a white person that I feel the same way about black people, which would be incorrect. Okay. Um, while this is an extreme example, we need to be very careful that we do not assume the beliefs or assume the intentions of others. Um, uh, just because someone is of the same demographic than you, maybe the same age range, maybe they're the same gender, maybe they're from the same uh, part of the country or same part of the world, don't assume that they agree with you or disagree with you automatically. Even if you both hold, uh, hold licensure with the same organization, don't automatically assume uh, that, that, that you will have a lockstep agreement with everything concerning politics, with everything concerning race, with everything concerning uh, some of the more controversial topics that are swirling around, all right? Don't assume. Um, here's an easy one. Don't interrupt people while they're speaking. 
um, allow people to finish their thoughts. Obviously, um, neither party should attempt to dominate the conversation. But again, you need to know for your part, don't, don't be rude. Don't interrupt people. Um, the end of their sentence might change what you think about the beginning of their sentence. Um, and, and it's not helpful for you to automatically assume that, um, that, that what they're going to say at the end, uh, that, you know, don't assume what the end of their sentence is. Hear them out and try to understand. Don't interrupt them. Don't just listen waiting for your turn to speak. Oftentimes, people only sit down and listen uh, so that they have a chance to speak, and they're waiting for that break in the conversation so that they can give you their opinion. When someone speaks, sincerely try to listen to them. Sincerely try to understand them. Sincerely try to, to comprehend every, all, all their background and the different things that they're uh, uh, passionate about. Um, listen for understanding. Don't listen just waiting for your turn to speak. And finally, I will end with this. Do not assume that you have to have an answer for everything. This goes back to the principle of the fact that you are not perfect. You are not infallible. You, do not, you are not Jesus Christ. You are not Lord Almighty. You do not have all the answers at the end of the day. And if so, someone says something and you are not sure that you have the answer to it or you are not confident in your answer, it's okay to say, I don't know. Now, again, this doesn't absolve you of being studious. This doesn't absolve you of being well-read. This doesn't absolve you of, of, of preparation, right? You should be prepared. One of the verses that we read said you should always be ready to give an answer. But that being said, uh, just because you need to be ready to give an answer does not mean that you are going to have every answer, right? At the end of the day, there are many topics that I am forced to say I don't know. I don't, I'm not an expert in every subject matter. I don't have an answer to all of the world's problems. If any person did fall into that category, then by that logic, all of the world's problems would be over if we had a correct answer to every single problem in every single situation. Um, but, but sometimes you have to learn to embrace the power of I don't know. And some things you won't have an answer to, and that's okay. Even Christ himself says, I don't know the day that he's returning. If someone is trying to engage you in a discussion of the end times and a discussion of when God has to come back uh, or when he's going to return to earth, right, coming from uh, a Christian uh, eschatological uh, position and conversation and point of view, um, if Christ himself was willing to say, I don't know, even the Son of Man does not know, then this should give us a lot more comfortability to say, there are some things that I don't have the answer to. Again, this also goes back to something else that we talked about. Say what the Bible says and refuse to say what it doesn't. The Bible speaks to a lot of different things, but the Bible was also written 2,000 years ago before a lot of the development of modern technology. Um, so there are principles that we can apply. There are certainly, uh, obviously, uh, to, to hold on to Jesus not, and to hold on to the principles of doctrine. To, we need to hold on to what we do know and not just say, well, because I don't know everything, then I don't know anything. That's also not unhelpful. Just because you don't know everything does mean you know something. Um, but you need to be willing to clarify and admit when you don't know something. Um, and that's okay. It's okay not to know everything. And um, I'm going to conclude with this quote. I know I've talked about a lot of different things, and I hope that this will be helpful to you. But this is a quote that I have found to be particularly helpful. You are not responsible for your first thought but you are responsible for your second thought and your first action. You're not responsible for your first thought, right? But you are responsible for your second thought and your first action. Uh, oftentimes growing up, my parents told me, excuse me, they told me, think before you speak. Uh, consider things before you allow those words to so freely flow from your mouth. Um, and we would do well to remember this as we have difficult conversations with people in our church, as we have difficult conversations with people who have all kinds of different backgrounds and experiences who walk into our churches, um, even if we disagree with them, even if we grew up with a certain opinion or a certain stereotype about that group of people, uh, even if uh, uh, we had all these different background experiences and, and we are convinced 
we don't do well um, to allow those first thoughts to dominate. Instead, what's your second thought? What, 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 what are you responsible for after that first thought and that first stereotype comes into your mind? What's your second thought? How do you self-dialogue with that? And then when you dialogue with that person and when you're in conversation with that person, what actions are you taking? Are you being respectful? You're not responsible for your first thought, but you are responsible for your second thought and your first action. Um, and that would be how I would conclude this message. Uh, I'm sorry, this presentation about having difficult conversations. Um, if you are interested, if you have further uh, questions, if you want to dialogue about this in any regard, you can feel free uh, to reach out to me, to contact me um, in any manner that is available to you, and I'd be more than willing to have a dialogue with you um, about, about this topic. Um, I thank you for your time. I thank you for listening, and God bless.